John, we're joined this week on the show by someone we certainly found uh, observant and uh, full of information when he was in New York. That's Mark Hanna. Yes, I'm certainly excited about our guest uh, today. Uh, very, very smart guy, and we have a lot of topics. Obviously, the Brewer is very hot. He's been outstanding for the Brewers, but certainly want to ask him about Buck. We want to ask him about Fam's comments, Alonzo, uh, Council. Uh, could he possibly leave the Brewers? So lots of good stuff to talk about with Mark Hanna today. Great tease, John. People are going to have to join us for that. They'll also listen to what we think are the big stories of this season. That's if you stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Hayden. John, we, we knocked out last week two of the bigger awards in the AL and the uh, NL MVP. I think the Cy Youngs are relatively obvious. It's totally obvious in the American League with Garrett Cole. If it, there are any questions, Blake Snell's last 23 starts have been just overwhelming. Uh, there's other people to like, uh, Logan Webb, Corbin Burns, Zach Wheeler, but I think it's Snell. So I think we decided to try something else, which is what are the stories of this season, of the 2023 season? Uh, we both have a few. We didn't tell each other what they are. What, why don't you start, John? What, what do you think was a gigantic story this year? Well, I mean, I think the rule changes certainly helped in Major League Baseball. The attendance is up 9%. The game got somewhat more exciting. I, I do think that is a positive, um, you know, uh, it cut the, ga the games by about 30 minutes, almost 30 minutes. Uh, more stolen bases, slightly higher batting average if you're not paying attention to the Yankees. So I, I think that was a plus and uh, <laughs> give MLB credit. Yeah. Uh, you know, John, I think we said let's do three each. So I did four because I assumed you were going to do rule changes and we'd have at least that. Uh, if I were picking what was second after that, I would say disappointing teams. Uh, I went and looked at uh, uh, Bet MGM just to see what they had going into spring training. They had the Yankees over under 95 and a half, Mets 95 and a half, San Diego 93 and a half, St. Louis 89 and a half. Interestingly, Cleveland 87 and a half turned out, you know, White Sox 84 and a half. Uh, the reason I bring it up is obviously it was a storyline of the season, especially in yeah. our town, right? Both teams, the number one and two payroll were disappointing. John, I I wonder, do you think it does anything to the free agent market this offseason where teams say, well, look at these teams. They went to the like the zenith of where they could go to payroll wise and they still didn't win. Is there something to let's spread our money out more, even if we're going to have a big payroll? Do you think this has some implications? Maybe, uh, probably not enough, because it only takes one in free agency. Let's uh, face facts. That That's the way free agency works, and uh, these agents are very good, and uh, there are enough star players. I mean, it's not the greatest free agent market ever, but I still think the top 10 guys, obviously Otani, number one, but certainly Bellinger with the year he had, and, uh, you know, I mean, Chapman's still great defender, did not have a good second half, but a lot of good pitchers, Montgomery, uh, sorry to keep uh, knocking the Yankees here, but he's one of them. Snell, another one, obviously. Uh, Nola, very good. You got the Japanese guys, Yamamoto, uh, also really good. So, uh, you know, I think those guys are still going to get paid. Uh, interestingly enough, that was my other uh, number, one of the top three. Uh, that was the first one I thought of was these disappointing teams. It's really incredible. And maybe it's because my predictions were so bad. I don't know if they were as bad as bet MGM, but. Uh, they probably were, you know, I had San Diego in the World Series and, uh, you know, they're going to be under 500 very likely here. Uh, shocking with a run differential of a plus 90. Uh, it's been a weird, weird year, but uh, certainly the Yankees and the Mets in our city. Uh, very, very disappointing. The Mets with an all time payroll. White Sox, brutal. Now they're talking whether 99 or 100 is a bigger, it's a bigger disaster. Does it matter? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, they're an abject disaster no matter what. So, uh, you know, I, it's, it's been amazing. It's been a very unpredictable season. I'll give myself that excuse, but uh, these disappointing teams, that's, that's might be number one on the list, beating the rule changes. Uh, you know, just, just to stick with this, John, you said, uh, you mentioned how fooled we were. Is this anom an anomaly? 
I wonder, do some of these teams think it was an anomaly? Like the Yankees and the Mets have to, the Mets have already made big decisions, right? They've kind of refocused where they're going. But do the Yankees look at this and go, this was a bizarre year uh, and made more bizarre because it they probably have an injury problem that they need to look into. But the two key injuries of the season are freak injuries. It's Judge running into a wall and Rizzo's head hitting Fernando Tatis Jr.'s leg. If those two guys don't get hurt, do they, of all these teams, they're the only one that has a real shot of finishing over 500, maybe San Diego, but the Yankees got a real shot. Do they look at it and go, hey, everything went wrong and we're still this, or do they have to kind of do the complete blow up here? I see you shaking your head. You know where I stand. I I agree with you, by the way, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're, they're, they've got an outside agency. I, they may already be looking at it. They certainly will start soon. So, you know, at least they're going to give the appearance of uh, taking this very seriously. And, and I, I think that they will. I mean, Judge, you saw his comments. Uh, he, he thinks there are things that are very wrong. I, I, and, you know, that injury thing, is it luck? I mean, this has gone, been going on for a while. They brought in the Cressy group, I don't know, in 2018 or something like that. And they have gotten no better. Uh, they put... Two more on the injured list in the last couple of days, and I, I I had them going into the weekend as third most injured days, third most injured appearances. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously the Angels, the star-crossed Angels, are worse, and of course they lost their biggest guys. I, you know, can we say it's luck? I mean, some of it is they have older players, but not really. And you know, freak injuries, okay, but did anyone think Rizzo was out for the year? Um, you know, I mean, they, they brought him back in three days. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not a doctor, so it's hard for me to completely second guess that. But that looks like a mistake from here. I, I mean, uh, they they had a bad year. I mean, their run differential is nothing great. You can't claim that they're unlucky like the Padres. Uh, they were mediocre, uh, almost start to finish. They were a mediocre team. Yeah, and John, you mentioned the Yankees were third in injuries, the Angels were second. Number one is the Dodgers, who are going to win 100 games right. again this year. They're number one. The Yankees need to be the East Coast Dodgers. Uh, the Mets are trying to be the East Coast Dodgers. The Dodgers lost essentially an entire starting rotation. Uh, they're great at development. They brought in young starters like Bobby Miller and Machia, and they, the machine keeps going. When they give big money out, they don't give it to Giancarlo Stanton. They give it to Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman. Great all-around players who have retained their skill uh, level at, at a high level. Uh, you know, that that's the team the two New York teams are shooting at. And by the way, San Diego also, right? The idea of the Padres building up was to finally outdo the Dodgers. And I would ask that question, if they don't do it this year, the Padres, right. when will that, that, that ever happen? John, why don't we, is there uh, other big stories that we, we want to talk about here? I think we hit the two biggest ones, right? Rule changes the and the disappointment. Any, anything else stand out for you? Well, I mean, we've had some outstanding seasons. I guess you could say that about any year, but I mean, Otani's season was historic. You could argue that Acuna's was historic and is he still the MVP. I mean, you and I go back and forth on this. I think most people would say he is the MVP. Betts is pretty spectacular, playing a lot of shortstop and third and second base very, very well. And, putting up similar numbers to Acuna. I think the fact that Acuna's numbers are historic in terms of the home run and the stolen base, I think he's going to get probably 25 out of the 30 first place votes. So he's probably going to be a fairly easy winner. But I mean, those three guys had historic seasons. Judge might've had one if he had missed one third of the season with his freak injury. Yeah. You know, you, we've mentioned the name a couple of times. I wonder just as we think about big stories, John, because of what it will mean moving forward, the Angels' decision for a second straight year not to trade Otani at, at the deadline, you know, few people did as much reporting on this as you. You have a feeling, especially last year, then again this year, just what teams were lined up ready to do to get their hands on this player. And it was interesting, just to go back to that bet MGM thing, you know, three other disappointing teams because of where they were in the middle of the season were the Angels, Giants, and Red Sox. I will say bet MGM got them Right. A a L.A., the Angels and Giants at 80.5, Red Sox at 77.5. Yeah. But, you know, the Angels went for it. And literally from the moment they went from it to today, they share the worst record in the sport with the Rockies. And what that will mean moving forward for them, not to have turned Otani into some stuff moving forward. I wonder if that's a, you, a big story this year that will be even a bigger story as we go along. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I understood it at the time. I mean, Otani is a phenomenon. Uh, they want to do everything they can to try to keep him. The story isn't written yet. Is it possible that he stays? I guess it's possible. I mean, was it a bad sign that he packed up his stuff? He did come back. Um, we'll see. Uh, you know, it's probably going to be difficult for them to keep him. I mean, if, if he wants to win, it does not look like they're going to be able to win next year. They were not good in the second half. They traded away two out of the top three prospects. Uh, I got it at the time. I, 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 I certainly understood. He he is a special guy that we haven't seen come, you know, since Babe Ruth. So none of us who are around have seen, seen anybody like this. And uh, it's amazing. I mean, even when he came back, there were people, they were still drawing crowds just to see him in the dugout. So, uh, you know, I understand it, and, but it certainly does not look good for the future for the Angels. Do you have any? I have one other one. Do you have another one you want to talk about? Big no, I think I think I did three. You you all, you asked me to do three. So yeah. I just do the well, you, you, I I came up like I said I came up with a fourth. <laughs> I was so sure you were going to do rules that yeah. I came up with a fourth. The all fourth right, one go. is kind of an offshoot of the for, of the disappointing team, but it has a lot to do with New York baseball. It's just I think for the first time this year, Steve Cohn showed the financial flex that he can do going forward. First in his willingness to go to nearly $500 million between payroll and luxury tax. And then at the deadline, the willingness to eat just scads of money on Verlander and Scherzer. I mean, he's got like $100 million in dead money with everything that was done uh, this year to be able to buy prospects that he wants moving forward. You know, the game has been scared of him, John, since he came in. I think you know this again. It's something you've talked about a lot and reported on. When the Padres flex, the rest of the industry goes, where are they getting this money from? What does it mean? Yeah. You know, there's some fear in the commissioner's office about debt service, et cetera. Nobody is worried about debt service with the Mets. They're just worried about what Cone could do. There's already war drums for the next CBA if they're going to find a way to slow Cone down. So I think. 2023, even though it didn't go great on the field for the Mets, I think there's going to be memory of, oh, Steve Cohen began to exhibit exactly what he's capable of doing. Yeah, I mean, absolutely right. It, uh, they had the record payroll. I think they'll still end up with a record payroll. Uh, they had a tax it was going to be over $100 million just in tax. So, I mean, that's got to be painful even for somebody with $20 billion. We don't know exactly what anybody has, but approximately $20 billion. So, you know, I give the Mets and the Padres credit for going for it. They, they both lost a lot of money this year. I do think the Padres, it is an issue for the Padres. They don't have an owner with $20 billion, neither does anybody else. And uh, it certainly has got to sting for them uh, even more. And now they've got Hayter and Snell as free agents. So uh, difficult situation. And uh, the Mets are in a better spot. I, 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 I mean, I do think the Mets did the right thing. I mean, it did show his financial might that he was willing to pay down the Scherzer and Verlander contracts to get prospects back. But he did lower the payroll, too, to some degree. Did it show some limitation, some limitation? I mean, it's got to hurt to lose. And I've been told it's over $200 million. It's got to hurt a little bit. So there might be a little bit of a hint of a limitation there. I mean, it's certainly way above anybody else. But I'm wondering if it if it, I mean, it showed his financial might, but did he show some limitation there at the end? Because he could have just kept those two players and then bought a bunch more players too, and you know, lost five hundred million next year. You know, maybe he's not willing to do that. Yeah, I thought he was logical, uh, not financial. I think he didn't like what twenty twenty four would look like with the older pitchers and the older team. John, uh, I wonder, as just a kind of a quick way to wrap up uh, this the segment, uh, we've kind of talked about what Cones did, the Mets. Uh, we we batted around a little bit the idea of uh, which team is set up better, kind of like moving to the future, the Mets or the Yankees. The Mets have so totally refocused uh, on the future. The Yankees clearly brought up a lot of prospects the last six weeks, uh, knowing what their fate was, that they were going to miss the playoffs for the first time since 2016. Who do you think set up better? You know, I give the Yankees some points because they always have a winning season. And as we do this now, they still have a winning record. So they have a good chance to have another winning season, even in a disastrous season, as even Brian Cashman made it. But I think it's the Mets because of Steve Cohn and his willingness to do whatever it takes to win. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, Al Steinbrenner has spent a lot of money. Uh, he brought Judge back, which was the right move. Uh, their payroll is second highest, even above the Padres. 
so they certainly are putting in an effort, but uh, nobody's putting in an effort like the Mets and Cone. So I- I'm going to say the Mets do. I think their prospect list now is above average. It may not be at the top, uh, but it's certainly above average thanks to the trades that they did make. Uh, they do need to get some pitching, though. A little worried about that right now. They only have two for sure pitchers next year in Senga and Quintana. Got some possibilities in uh, Peterson, obviously, uh, Budo, McGill, uh, maybe Lucchese. But those are just possibilities. Um, I'm going to say the Mets a little bit better. Yeah, you know, people are starting to talk about some of the pitching prospects drafted in recent years. Vassal, Stewart, Tidwell, uh, guys like that. I think the Mets have depth. Uh, The question is, will they have some stuff at the top? Senga has looked like an ace for about two-thirds of the season now. Will they be a big bidder on someone like Yamamoto to see if they could combine uh, two of the you know better Japanese pitchers of recent ilk uh, to at the top of their rotation? Uh, I think the Mets, because of Cone's largesse, are set up better. Uh, the Yankees have brought up some interesting prospects. Uh, too many of them continue to have a hitting style that I do not think works in the modern game, the way that it's being pitched now. I can't tell you how many opposing teams, managers, pitching coaches, a scouts have told me the Yankees are by far the easiest team to do advanced scouting for. It's kind of one look. And if you 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 could kind of get through their their lineup, uh, I'll throw this in. The team I was at the game yesterday, and of course he had a good game. He hit a long home run. When the Yankees have a left hand hitter in the lineup like Austin Wells, it reminds you how badly they need left hand hitting, how right. badly they need Rizzo to get healthy. Uh, you know, for Wells for them to come up with another, you know, the Martian to get healthy, who's a switch hitter. Uh, the the fact that the New York Yankees, who from Babe Ruth forward, short right field porch, had somehow allowed themselves to become so right-handed, besides unathletic, besides one note, uh, they need Wells to be a good player. Uh, and at least part of a catching first base DH platoon, it looks like he has a really nice swing. He's an important prospect for them moving forward. Yeah, I mean, it was allegedly a hit first uh, catcher, right? So. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's shown some signs. They've all shown some signs, but, you know, almost all of them are batting under 200. I know some people have just given up on batting average. I, I haven't. When you have a disappointing season, you hit 226 and you're only ahead of the A's. I, I think we have to look at it as, you know, they need to make more contact. They need to put the ball in play. They need to be more athletic. Uh, it would be good if Wells is a positive. I don't know if they're going to look at catcher. They may look at third base. Certainly look at center field. Uh, Dominguez looked great for that week that he was there or so. Uh, so that's a positive. So there are definitely some positives with the Yankees, but I'm with you on the left-handed batters. And I mean, right now, I mean, Bellinger looks like the obvious guy, right? I mean, he plays center field. He's versatile. He's, he's regained much of that MVP form. He's not the MVP this year, but certainly a contender for that top 10. And, uh, you know, he looks like a guy they could look at. Candelario could be a guy I think they could look at. Um, you know, I mean, Chapman has not hit that big in the second half and he's right-handed. So I think more likely I'd be interested to see on the Mets. Do they go at a third base? They have like three third base possibility. What do you think? Do they go at third base? I mean, they've got Beatty who's showing some signs now after a really not a good, uh, first half for him. You've got Mauricio who looks like a very athletic guy. You've got Vientos who certainly can hit home runs. Not sure he's a third baseman or a full-time third baseman. Uh, if you're the Mets, do you go for Chapman, or do you hope that one of those three guys is your starting third baseman? Yeah, I wrote a column uh, about ten days ago. Do the Mets have three first basemen, two first, a third? I'm sorry, three third basemen, two third basemen, one third baseman, or no third baseman? Uh, and I think it's an important question. I will say, multiple guys in their organization told me before even this little hot streak, don't give up on Beatty yet. Uh, so I I think they the way they set up. They need to go ahead and decide among this group, which is really going to be Maurizio Abadi, because Vientos is a bat. I don't think he can handle the defense at third base. The question is, do you want to make Vientos your prime DH, play him a little at first base, I think? You know, if I'm going to take them at their word, John, that they're going to try to win next year, but that it's kind of a refocused year, I think they got to put one of those guys at third base and see what it looks like and just trust Maybe, you know, like uh, there's a big left-hand hitting Japanese third baseman who might come over after the 2024 season, uh, set themselves up for that. But I, I'm going to trust 
their words, which is next year's a refocus. And I don't think it will be a clean refocus unless they fully find out about these guys. That, that yeah. would be my thought. I, we probably still need to know about Beatty. Uh, he hasn't had a full chance at this point. So maybe he can do it. He, he certainly was not good uh, in his first chance. But, uh, you know, they thought he was so great going in. There must have been a reason for that, right? So, um, and I, I, Mauricio looks so athletic. It would be a shame if he's not playing somewhere next year. I, and I would think it would be second base. I mean, does, does, uh, does McNeil look like a utility guy at this point uh, to you? He might be. Yeah, I actually think he looks like a Yankee. He would help them a lot more than yes, he I Mets. did. I thought of that this week. Yeah, uh, left-handed that's a, bat. Yeah, possibility. Yeah, Not bad. Yeah. Who gives you some of that batting average you talked about, and I agree on. Uh, one of the people who was with the Mets a lot of this season, and we'll have some thoughts on them on the Milwaukee Brewers, who are going to be the NL Central champs and are heading to the playoffs, is our guest Mark Hanna, who joins us next. Our guest this week on the show is uh, Mark Canna, who New York got to know well for a year plus uh, as the regular left fielder of the New York Mets. He's now with the eventual NL Central champion, Milwaukee Brewers, who are heading to the playoffs. And Mark, just as a first of all, thank you for joining us. And and, and just as a way, you, you had been traded once before, but never during a season. I'm wondering what, you know, we forget about the humanity of this, uh, what it takes to kind of go from you know, where you were, New York, it's a place you agreed to go, free agent, to suddenly, hey, you're someplace new and we need you to play great because these games really matter from here to the end. <laughs> um, yeah, this is wild from a kind of from a human standpoint, as you put it, um, for the families and and everything, just m- moving my family out here and uh, finding a place to live and moving all our stuff and I have two kids and, uh, getting them settled in, um, it was, it was wild. And, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it's a tough experience. I I think, you know, you don't know how it's going to affect you as a player and, and as a, you know, just in the day to day. And, um, it took a minute. It did take like probably a week or maybe two weeks to, for the dust to settle and for you to like start feeling comfortable and kind of normal again. Mark, you've been doing great with the Brewers. You're hitting great. Your OPS well over 800. The team is doing great. Were you surprised? I mean, you have, I guess you, you weren't surprised you were traded. Did you have any in, in, inclination that it would be the Brewers? Were you surprised? And how has it been for you there in Milwaukee? <laughs> um, yeah, I had no idea where, where I was going. I, like you said, it was, uh, I had a good idea I was going to be traded, but I didn't know where, I didn't know, you know, if I guess like, there was probably a little bit of chance, like thought in my head that, that I would say, or, you know, who was getting traded, how many people are getting traded. Um, but, uh, landing in Milwaukee, it turns out has been great. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I love it here. Um, I don't, it's hard to explain, but I, I've, I've said this to my wife before. It was like kind of the, the minute I walked into the clubhouse, it felt, I felt lighter. Like it felt like a little bit of, uh, I felt more relaxed. It felt like the guys, despite being, you know, in the position that they are as a team, that it was lighthearted. It was relaxed. It was like a kind of a good environment to come into. Um, just because of the identity of this team. And it's just kind of the way they carry themselves. And it's just a, a, a lighthearted, relaxed, yet professional environment that, that I think has allowed me to thrive. Mark, it kind of leads to a natural question. Uh, was it heavy in New York? It's New York. It was $500 million kind of worth of payroll and luxury tax this year. Expectations coming off 101 wins last year. Was it heavy? And if so, why? I think it's heavy in New York. I think regardless of the circumstances, it's heavy in New York. I think it was heavy in New York last year. It's always going to be that way. And it wasn't 
like it was a surprise to me signing with the Mets. Um, I knew what I was getting into. I think that's just the way it is. And, and I think I handle, I don't, you know, I think I handled it well. I think um, the guys handle it pretty well. And, and that's just the nature of the beast. And, um, you know, I think that you, you come to expect that as a, as an athlete playing in New York and the the scrutiny and everything that comes along with that. But I think that um, I'll say that, yeah, when it's kind of uh, last year was a little bit of a walk in the park. And when you start, when things don't work out, it was kind of uh, an awakening to me this year of like, Oh, okay. This is what, this is kind of what they're talking about. Cause last year, everything was, you know, kind of gravy for most of the year. And you're just like, huh, it, it doesn't seem that bad. And then <laughs> when, uh, when the team doesn't perform as well as the, as high as the expectations are, then, then yeah, you feel it a little bit more and it, it is a little bit, um, I, w- I was taken aback a little bit by, by it. And, uh, not that I was, you know, not that it was anything other than what I expected because you, you know, you're expected to win when you have a huge payroll and, you know, we all knew what the expectations were when we got to spring training and, uh, it's just, uh, but, but then as you're actually going through it as a person, it's, it's tough. Yeah. It's not, it's not easy. Since we're on the Mets, uh, I don't know if you saw, you probably did see what Tommy Pham said about the Mets uh, position players being the least hardworking position players he's seen. I, I was wondering, I, you know, we didn't sense that at all. I thought that the players, all the players cared a lot on the Mets. That's what we can judge. I don't know, hardworking or not. We don't, we, we have, would dif- have difficulty judging that. I wouldn't have thought that. Uh, did you have any reaction to him saying that? Uh you know, maybe he was just frustrated by the team's underperformance. I don't know. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I don't reaction. I, I'll, I'll say this. I, it doesn't surprise me really that Tommy said that. Just not, not because I feel the same way, but because of Tommy, the way that Tommy works specifically. And I think you, you talking about like other players and work ethics and stuff like that everybody kind of when you get to the big leagues everybody does their own thing to a certain extent and everybody has their own routine and and what works for them and the, and a lot of especially on a veteran team a lot of players have that routine kind of down pat and they they know how that what works for them and so guys are going to go about their business in their own way and tommy goes about his business in his own way and and the fact of the matter is is tommy hits and works and does like physical activity a lot more (laughs) his workload that he puts on himself on a daily basis is just it's significantly more than anybody else on the team so (laughs) i i I don't think i (laughs) necessarily like agree with the fact that other players don't work hard i think it's just to to expect everyone to work on it, the way that tommy fam works every day is is a little bit um a little bit much and you know that works for him and what what i do works for me and and um so but yeah it's it's kind of easy to say you know he just takes a lot more swings than other guys take on a daily basis. And um, maybe he, you know, I can see. So, you know, you know what I'm saying when I say that I, I can understand where he's coming from based on what he does. And and maybe he expects other people to to do the same as him. And, and, and that's kind of his mentality. And that's what works for him. Mark, you mentioned what a kind of, somewhat joyride at least till october last year was with 101 wins uh you're clearly an observant player why why do you think it didn't click this year in new york every prognostication system had you up in the mid to high 90s going into the season for number of wins and clearly by the trade deadline you and others were being moved why didn't it click this season that's a good question um 
and you'd think I'd have a an answer and obviously I, I've thought about it a lot because you we I expected the same as everyone else I expected that we were going to be really good and um, you know nothing we only got better since last year um, in the off season and you, you kind of uh, it makes you wonder but when you dive in a little deeper I now that I've had time to reflect on it I think that there's some things you could point to um, namely injuries was a tough one I mean losing um, Edwin Diaz in the World Baseball Classic was pretty uh, was a pretty rough one and when you when you look at like how the roster was constructed I think the mindset this year was was built upon pitching depth with it I mean we we had the acquisitions of David Robertson and Justin Verlander and you're like okay we're you know we're stocking up on pitching which is never a bad thing and then your closer goes down before the season starts and like a well we're pretty sure is a season ending injury and then Justin Verlander doesn't start with the team for the first month of the season so all of a sudden that pitching depth has like greatly diminished in the first first month of the season and um that's it's tough when you're when you're kind of hanging your hat on that and then you have injuries and then multiple suspensions throughout the year and other injuries and it, it's just um all of a sudden a, the the payroll that we have with all this depth and all these you know big names is is when you're not those guys aren't pitching all the time and it's just tough it's tough to you can never predict injuries that's the one thing and so it it's uh it made it i think tough to win in those first couple months when we're we're constantly banged up i'll move on to something a little more positive at this moment uh we i was with the team when you went to milwaukee and the brewers just creamed the mets for that series and they looked really good and we just thought it was three games but they've carried it on and been really good all year what makes the brewers so good I think pitching, number one, I mean, we were just talking about it. Um, I say this all the time. O- offenses can be a little bit fleeting, but but um, if you have pitching and, and you're able to stay healthy, and that was the thing that kind of struck me when we went to Milwaukee because I remember that series and kind of feeling like I, I think I, w- I went hitless in that series uh, for three games. And you don't, you know, you don't think about the, we're the Mets, right? We're the the team that's supposed to be the top dogs in that, in baseball. And uh, especially when you talk about pitching and I felt like there was no breaks in the, in the, in the Brewers staff. I was just like, why is nobody talking about this team and how good (laughs) this team's pitching staff is? Um, Just when you like facing guys like, Freddie Peralta and, you know, um, Corbin Burns and, and Brandon Woodruff. It's just like, there, there's no, it's, it's a relentless attack of, um, of high quality arms. And, and I think, I don't know, maybe it's a small market thing that kind of sneaks up on you, but I think that's a big thing. And then, and then also, um, the position players, they had these, a good mix of young and experienced position players with like you have Christian Yelich and you have, uh, I don't know. I mean, like he's the veteran and then there's a bunch of young guys that can play really well. And I think I remember like Bryce Terang hit his first home run off us that year, that series. And it was a grand slam. And I'm like, who is this Bryce Terang kid? And they got all this team speed and they somehow they have William Contreras too. And you're just <laughs> like, what, what is this team? And, and they kind of, you know, shocked us. And, um, it's since I've been here, you kind of, you get it. You're like, Oh, this is real. Like, this isn't just like a, a fun team. You know, they, they got a lot of talent here and it's, um, it's been fun to be a part of. Mark, uh, I'm sorry, forgive me. I'm going to just go back to the Mets for one second because, uh, (laughs) again, just, 
because you are observant and you were there. And I think they have two two key questions about the group you know well moving forward, what they're going to do, which is, mm -hmm. are they going to keep the manager, Buck Walter, and are they going to keep Pete Alonso long term? Um, I, I'll, I'll start with Buck. You played for him for a year and a half. The guy is coincidentally coming from Milwaukee and David Stearns to run the the, the team. He's going to have to decide on the manager. What did you think about Buck Showalter as a manager? And do you think he's the kind of guy who could navigate the Mets from here to a better place? Yeah, I mean, right when you say his name, I just smile because I, I love Buck. And um, playing for him was amazing and so much fun and um, and just a, a great experience. I think he's such a good baseball mind and um, – the attention to detail on this guy is unreal. And it's just, um, I, I think any team would be, I, it sounds cliche and it sounds like I'm making an overarching statement, but I, I honestly think that Buck could manage any team because he, the way he handles players, the way he handles people in the organization that your your you know analytics groups and staffs coaching staffs and the way he manages bullpens it, it's i don't think there's anything he doesn't think about and it's amazing because you're like you know he's one of the let's face it he's one of the older guys managing a baseball team right now and there's the sharpness is like incredible like it is just I mean, we have meetings every day. We have meetings in spring training where we're talking about bunt plays. And, and I'm never, it kind of reminds me of an old high school, my, my old high school coach, a guy named Gary Cunningham at Bellarmine College Prep, who was just like attention to detail, like this baseball, super passionate, like baseball guy who would just, harp on the smallest details about the game that you don't really think about very much, but then you realize they kind of come up, it, they come up more than you, you think they do. And, and Buck is such an observant person. And I think that, um, I really don't think that he doesn't, he misses anything when it comes to managing a baseball team. I think he's taking into account all of these things, like all of the different factors that affect a group of people I and mean, he's just good at, at doing that. So I, I don't think that, you know, I think that Buck could manage any team. I don't think he's uh, part of a, a problem there or anything like that. Mark, just, just to follow the other guy was Alonzo. Again, the coincidence being yeah. that Milwaukee was talking uh, to the Mets <laughs> about acquiring him uh, at the trade deadline, I'm sure with David Stearns here knowing their farm system well, I could imagine that that might get rekindled. I'm wondering if I could focus on what you think about Alonzo's long term with the Mets, but also some something came out in a report by somebody who not in the clubhouse that Alonzo was a clubhouse problem. Uh, I wonder if you could kind of address that and address. Can you imagine Pete Alonzo playing any place but with the Mets? It'd be hard to imagine, isn't it? Um, he kind of feels like such a New York guy and, and he really embraces uh, that role and kind of just being like, I don't know. He, he's just so all in on the Mets and, it, and it's, uh, I love playing with Pete and uh, yeah, I mean, saying that he's a problem in the clubhouse couldn't be further from the truth. Uh you know, I could say like, oh, well, everyone has their own opinion, but I, I honestly can't imagine you both have been in the New York Mets clubhouse. I I can't imagine how anyone would come to that conclusion that Pete's a problem in the clubhouse. I think it's the opposite of that. I think Pete is kind of a big part of the identity of the New York Mets. And um, not to mention, you know, a world class perennial power hitting first baseman that that doesn't come around very often and uh one of the best hitters i've ever seen in my life so um yeah i i think whatever they decide you know pete's gonna end up somewhere and uh it's just gonna be a matter of who wants him and and um yeah 
he's Pete's an amazing human and amazing baseball player. And um, yeah, quite frankly, I can't say it enough, but leave the, the, the man out of it. He's one of the best baseball players I've ever seen at hitting a baseball. It, it's incredible. I'm glad you cleared that. I only have two more questions, but I'm glad you cleared that, Pete Alonzo. That's a bunch of baloney. A kid didn't come from either of us. Uh, Pete Alonzo cares a yeah, lot about he's winning. So we don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't imagine anyone, like, who would even want to, like, slander this man's name if you've ever met him. He's, like, the most pure hearted guy I've ever, like, you could it's, meet it's, at a clubhouse. Well, yeah. Mark, I, 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 yeah, I worked yeah. here 35 years. I'm usually expecting the left-right combination in some way that, you know, sometimes you kind of yeah. hear one and go, ah, I got a little inkling of that. That one I didn't have any inkling when it came. Yeah. Like, like, where did that come from? That seems yeah. wildly uh, yeah. out of left field. Thank you for knocking it down. We appreciate that because it was it's just stupid. It really is. And anyway, yeah. I, I, uh, we agree with you on Buck as well, but I, I – and this is going to be a little tougher one for you because you've only been there for a little while, but I know you're a smart guy. You went to Cal Berkeley. So uh, <laughs> you'll probably have to be a super genius to figure this one out, but Craig council, yeah. uh, you mm -hmm. know, he's a free agent as you are. Uh, you know, I, I have suggested with David Stearns here, you know, maybe the Mets, which have some interest. I mean, Craig council, you said Pete Alonzo feels like a New Yorker. I mean, Craig council is a Milwaukee and he's from Whitefish Bay. His daughters still go to high school there. He's got homes there. Uh, is there any chance that you? Yeah, I, I know it's a this is a tough question. Any chance he's leaving the Brewers? Can you can you tell in any way whether there'd be any chance that he would be leaving the Brewers? Uh, yeah, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I, I thought that would be hard. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a tricky one. Um, I I really couldn't even begin to guess. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure. I. I haven't even um really met david stearns in person so i don't i i can't even give you anything because i don't really sure. i don't know the nature of of i'm sure they have a some kind of relationship there um and so i don't know i i it's not hard to fathom that somebody would want craig council to manage their team you know i think he's been extremely successful here and um I think anyone would be will, would be lucky to have him and kind of he kind of embodies like the the spirit of this team really well and and how relaxed it is yet on top of everything and and um yeah I I don't know but uh, I knew that'd be a tough one. <laughs> yeah, <they're> certainly <laughs> talking about it. Um but I I don't know. I part of me just as a person kind of likes Craig council here. Like I, I just, it, it feels like the right thing, but, but obviously, you know, these guys, people are going to do what they want to do. And, uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. Well, let me ask you about the other team that you played for. You're from Northern California. You went to Cal, uh, obviously had a lot of great success with the A's. There's so many great A's scattered all over the place. A couple on the Braves. You've got Olsen. You've got Murphy. You've got uh, Chapman. Uh, so uh, Semyon. Uh, obviously, we can see why this team was so good. Uh, and now, obviously, they want to move to Las Vegas. It's hard for me to keep up on what the latest on that is, but we kind of assume that they probably are. What What's your feel about that? My own personal feel is, and you don't have to agree with me, is that uh, I get it. I think Las Vegas would they'd be very successful there. I personally don't feel that ownership uh, deserves to be rewarded with the franchise value, probably go up by a billion dollars if they go to Las Vegas. But do you have any feelings about the team leaving Oakland, going to Las Vegas? Um, I don't, my feelings about that situation are probably like largely biased as a Bay Area native. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I, it, it's kind of sad for, for me and for, I grew up going to A's games and Giants games alike, but, um, but yeah, just the, this like going to the Coliseum was always felt like a kind of a special place when you went there, like unique, 
I'll say. And, and uh, I always loved playing for the A's and I felt like it was a huge honor and just, um, I mean, uh, Oakland has a, a great identity as like a, a fan base. It, it might not, you know, they might not show up in the numbers that some of the other places show up in and, and grant, uh, you know, I'll give you that. But in terms of like the quality of people that are there and it, it's amazing when I, when I would go back there, people, security guards, everyone is like coming up to me and hugging me and telling me they miss me and, and just stuff like that. Like how warm that fan base is towards their players is really um, special and, and it's sentimental and sure. And there, there's a business side to the game and I understand that, but uh, it's just going to be kind of sad for me uh, to see Oakland lose a team. If, if that's, what's going to happen, I don't, you know, and then, you said it about the story. I don't know where they're at with that. Um, there's always a lot of stories being written about the the political climate surrounding the situation. And it's just a lot of, it's very confusing for me as a, someone who's kind of looking at it from the outside. You know, Mark, I, I don't want to bury some of the lead here. You know, like we've talked about a lot of stuff we haven't mentioned. You know, you've played 46 games with the Brewers. You're hitting 296 with an 839 OPS and lots of big hits for you there. Mm -hmm. I don't want that to go absent during this conversation. <laughs> and just as a way to wrap it up, you've kind of touched on it a little with Council and some of the players. We had Matt Arnold, the GM of the Brewers, as a guest a few weeks back. And I think the first thing I asked is from the outside looking in, there's a team about to make the playoffs for the fifth time in six years, the year they missed it, they missed by one game. So it's been an exceptional team for a while. And you don't kind of look at it and go, oh, that should be exceptional. Having been there a quarter of a season now, do you have a feel? What is the secret sauce on why this team is consistently a good team? And players play well there, right? You're playing well. Josh Donaldson, mm -hmm. who was terrible in New York, has been there for a little bit. He's helping the team win. What 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 is the secret sauce of the Milwaukee Brewers? I think um, they have kind of a really good mix of players on the team, just just in terms of like different skill sets, um, veteran versus youth. You kind of have this this great balance of different types of players, which leads to the team being able to win in a lot of different kind of ways. Um, I've, we've walked off on infield hits because we, we have guys with a lot of speed. Um, we've hit big home runs in big spots because there's four or five guys in the lineup that you circle and you're like, well, this guy can be dangerous if he's hot and, you know, this guy can, can pump you. And, uh, not to mention kind of the, the personalities and, and the, the clubhouse atmosphere that I mentioned there, there is kind of a secret sauce. You've got a lot of guys with, with a lot of charisma that have um, the ability, this kind of uh, clutchness that can come out and show its, show its face at any time, like Willie Adamez and, and William Contreras and Carlos Santana. And I feel like I'm, you know, can be a clutch guy in, in certain moments. And you combine that with a lot of like raw, Christian Yelich, I didn't mention, um, but you combine that with a lot of like raw young talent and, and guys like Terang and guys like Sal Freelich and and um, so many. I'm trying to uh, Tyrone Taylor's had a lot of big hits lately. Like you know these these guys are undoubtedly talented young players are kind of adding to that it's a it's a potent mixture and uh and then you have the pitching staff which is great and that's kind of you know i think what what the organization hangs its hat on for sure and that's easy to see and that's a really good way to win baseball games as well well mark anyone who listened to this conversation knows why uh you were well liked and well missed and now in new york uh for your uh, observations and your thoughtfulness and your honesty. Uh, John, John and I appreciate you joining us on the show, and we hope we see you someplace along the line in October. 
Thank you. Thanks for having me. I know I, the long way. It's another way of saying, yeah, he just talks a lot, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I tend to uh, have long winded answers, but it's, it's just cause I'm uh, passionate about what I do and, and really, um, really enjoy it and, and kind of being observant of it. I'm a, I'm a very uh, it's, it's more than just my job. It's passion. So. Yeah, next time we're going to ask you about your food blog too, because I know you have a good food blog and you've actually found good places to eat in Milwaukee. I, I recommend Sanford yeah. and there's a new one, Birch coming out, but I, I've seen some of your blogs and you found, you've yeah. found some really good ones. I went to Birch actually. I oh. haven't been to, I haven't been to Sanford yet, but uh, yeah. yeah, Birch was really good. Good. Yes. Well, I hate to break in on your Milwaukee <laughs> talk, John, but we have to wrap this up and we'll wrap and we'll wrap it up by pointing out, uh, uh, Mark, a lot of people talk a lot and say nothing. You talk a lot and say a lot. Uh, that is. Meaningful. Oh, thank you. So so we appreciate we appreciated you in New York. We appreciate you now and we appreciate you joining us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. Thanks for having me, guys. We thank Mark Canna again for joining us. John, uh, we always close the show with hit or error. What do you got? I'm going to go error and uh, the poor Oakland A's. I shouldn't say poor, but they are poor. I, I got to give them the error for giving the uh, the cheap bottle of wine to uh, Miguel Cabrera. I, I guess $90. It's not a cheap bottle of wine for me, but for a going away gift for a future Hall of Famer, uh, just pathetic. Uh, just sad. It looks I mean, it's something I would do on my way to, uh, you know, a uh, Passover celebration with my uh, cousin downtown. Go get, get, Oh, I didn't get anything. I'll stop and get a bottle of cheap bottle of wine. Here I go. Uh, just pathetic for the A's. And to throw, to not forget that Miguel Cabrera was an alcoholic. So I wouldn't give him a bottle of wine anyway. Even if you splurged and got him a $500 bottle of wine, uh, I don't think that's a good idea. So Oakland A's get my error this week. I'm going to stay in the division. I, I don't know whether to call it a hit or an error. I guess it's an error. Uh, you know, Mike Trout talked this week. Uh, he was emotional about not being able to finish the season. And he talked about coming back next year with the angels again. And in some ways, look, it's Mike Trout. I'm sure under the right circumstances, somebody would trade for him because he is Mike Trout, but I would keep this in mind, John, he's got seven years at a little over $248 million left. If he were a free agent this off season, what would he get? I don't think it would be close to seven years of 248 no, million, no. right? So like he's a distress asset sitting today. He turned 32 last month. I look, he's played in 237 of the last 486 games over the last three seasons. That's under 50%. It's 48.8%. You know, he's kind of damned himself to the angels by re-enlisting with them. You know, he's done it twice. The second time, should he have gone out on the market? He's led a pretty comfortable life there, except for that they never get to the playoffs and we're watching. I know he got in once, three games, eliminated. He didn't play very well in those three games. We're watching a kind of Ernie Banks Hall of Fame career here, which is the absence of important postseason moments uh, from a great career. And it's an error because it's just sad to me to watch it. Yeah. Is it an error or a hit? You started. You weren't, I don't you know. Sure. What would you call it? I think it's an <laughs> I, error. I, I'll, I'll make it a macro error on him to reenlist yeah. the second time that he's in this right. kind of position now. Uh, talking about this as Otani's probably going to walk out the door as well, right? Right. Well, yeah, but I, I I agree with you. It's a hit or an error. You can't be sure. He does get loyalty points, right? That is a positive thing. And he wanted to win with the, his original team that drafted him when several 24 other teams, I think it was 24 or so, uh, passed and obviously made a mistake. Um, so I, I get it. Uh, it is kind of a shame. And it's interesting that he's only played half the games uh, in the last few years. Um, yeah, it, it, I've, I've written about the possibility of a trade. Uh, certainly have to pay that way down. The one logical trade to me would be trade Stanton for uh, Trout, right? Stanton I, is even more overpaid, but much fewer years. Uh, so you could just almost trade them almost straight up i think uh you know stanton is from los angeles uh, trout the yankees wanted to draft him uh, before the angels nabbed him i mean i'm just i'm just dreaming in my head i think that's probably you, did a, you a see, thousand or one shot <laughs> did you see on the uh, on post plus last week which is our uh, pay site i d i'm doing now a fake trade a week my yeah. fake trade was stanton rodon and will warren for trout it's uh, Stanton and Rodon are almost a complete salary wash, but it ends a lot earlier 
for both than for Trout. And you get Rodon, who under the right circumstances is a sort of a at least middle top of the rotation guy, plus a legitimate prospect. You get Trout out. You're done with the money earlier. It was my I by the way, all three guys in that trade have no trade clauses, and I don't think any one of them would accept it. Uh yeah. I think. I'm not sure. Would Stanton go to get it? I think Stanton, as bad as things are, I think he kind of loves New York. He loves New York anyway. Yeah, and yeah he I don't to, think he's he, looking he, to get out of here. Uh, and he wants to win. If yeah. you go to the Angels right now and you yeah. remove Trout, you know, and we don't think Otani's likely coming back, yeah. you know. It's hard to get somebody to go. To He's the from to Southern point. California. I think, you know, he turned down trades uh, to San Francisco and St. Louis uh, when he was in Miami. If the Dodgers or Angels had said, you know, the Dodgers did try to get him uh, yeah. at that time, uh, but they wanted a lot more paid down than the Marlins were willing to do. If, look, it's all pipe dream. I The guy's yeah. probably not getting traded this offseason. Uh, he has a new trade clause. He indicated he will likely be back in spring training next year. I just right. think for a great career, it's sad when you don't see him on the stage. Like Otani needs to go someplace where we see him on the stage. Right, right. And uh, we think that he probably will give himself an opportunity, at least get in the playoffs. It is pretty amazing. And I covered that series uh, with Trout against the uh, Royals, in which he had one hit. Uh, it is pretty amazing that that's his only appearance. That's even more amazing than Ernie Banks, when fewer teams got him, many fewer teams got in the playoffs. It's pretty incredible uh, that Trout has never has seen those three games and the future doesn't look too bright to see any more games anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, we'll obviously follow Mike Trout's uh, what happens with him in the off season. If anything, John mentioned guys like Cody Bellinger or free agency. That's if you stick with the show, a podcast from the New York post. Thanks as always to our producers, Jake Brown, Andrew Hartz. Don't forget the show drops on the yes, uh, app uh, about noon every Wednesday. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, rate, review the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Hayden.